All right, everyone. Uh, so let's get started. So welcome uh, to our fifth annual Turfy Lecture. Uh, these lectures are made possible by a generous donation from Al Turfy, who is sitting right over there. So let's give Al a hand. And our talk for this year will be given by Dr. Arthur Benjamin. Uh, so Dr. Benjamin is a professor of mathematics at Harvey Mudd College in Claremont, California. He's also a professional magician and has combined his two loves to create the show that you're about to see. Dr. Benjamin has presented to audiences all over the world and has appeared on many television programs, including the Today Show, CNN, and the Colbert Report. He has been written up in the New York Times, USA Today, Scientific American, and People Magazine. Princeton Review profiled him in their recent book, The Best 300 Professors. He has given three TED Talks, which have been viewed over 12 million times, and is the author of numerous books and DVD courses that share the beauty and magic of mathematics, which incidentally will be available after the talk is over. His newest book is called The Magic of Math, Solving for X, Variable, and Figuring Out Why, the word why. Reader's Digest calls him America's best math whiz, so please welcome the math magician, Dr. Art Benjamin. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Art Benjamin, and I am a mathemagician. What that means is I combine my loves of math and magic to do something I call mathemagics. But before I get started with anything, uh, I've got a quick question for the audience. By any chance, did anyone happen to bring with them this afternoon a calculator? If you have a calculator, I mean, perhaps on your phone or something, and if you're comfortable using it, raise your hand. They need a few people to help me out with their calculators. Uh, who's volunteering? We've got one, and let me get a few more. Uh, uh, two, and uh, let's see. Okay, Professor Wiggins, three, and uh, how about one more? One more volunteer from the audience. Uh, please, four. Would the four of you join me up here on stage with your calculators? And let's give these volunteers a nice round of applause. Come on. Over on this side, please. That would be great. One more round of applause for our brave volunteers. Now, since I have not had the chance to work with these calculators, I need to first make sure they are all working properly. Would somebody get us started by giving us a two-digit number, please? How about a 47. two? 47. And another two-digit number, please. 29. 29. Multiply 47 times 29 on your calculator. Make sure you get 1,363 exactly, or the calculators aren't working. Do I have you get 1,363? Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Now, I notice that took some of us a little time to get the answer, and that's okay. I'll give you a shortcut for multiplying even faster. There's something called the square of a number, which most of you know is taking a number and multiplying it by itself. For instance, 5 squared would be 25, 6 squared would be 36, 73 squared would be something bigger, right. <laughs> now most of your calculators have little shortcuts for squaring numbers and if you know them you should go ahead and use them. If not, you'll have to do it the long way. What I'm going to try and do now is to square in my head four two-digit numbers faster than they can do on their calculators even using the shortcut method. What I'll ask is four people, let's say here in the first row, a one, two, three, four, each yell out a two-digit number and if you would square the first, the second, the third, and the fourth one, it, it, this, like, is this coming out of my phone? Oh, this is crazy. I was saying, who's like, who's like calling or whose phone's going on? I better at least put this on a vibrator. I don't know what, what that was. Anyway, I was, I, I, so anyway, I'm going to ask each of you to call it a two-digit number. If you would square the first, second, third, and fourth, I will try and race you to the answer. So uh, quickly, a two-digit number, please. 83, okay, next. 97, 97 next. 56, and one more. 63. 63, would you call out your answers, please? 6,889. 6,889. 9,409. 3,136, finally. 3,969. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> now, I noticed, let me try to take this one step further. 
I'm going to try to square some three-digit numbers this time. I won't even write these down. I'll just call them out as they're called out to me. Anyone I point to call out a three-digit number. Anyone on our panel verify the answer. And if I get the answer right, give me a thumbs up. If I make a mistake, let me know and I'll try and fix it. A three-digit number, anyone? 561 squared is 314,721. 314721. Good. Another, uh, another three digit number. 767. 767 is 588,289. Yes. 588289. Good. How about another three digit number, sir? 956. 956 is 913,936. 913936. Yes. yes, good. How about one last three digit number? Go ahead. 632. 632 is 300, 399,424. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let me try to take this one step further. I'm going to try to square a four digit number this time. Now, I'm not going to beat you to the answer on this one, but I will try to get the answer right. To make this a little bit more random, how about we go to the back row, if I can get the first four of you to call out a single digit between zero and nine, that will be the four digit number that I'll use. Four. Seven. Seven. Zero. Zero. Three, did you say? And this is taking a little bit of time, so bear with me. Twenty-two million one hundred eighteen thousand two hundred and nine. Good. Thank you very much. Now, I would attempt to square a five-digit number, and I can, but unfortunately, some calculators don't go that high. Don't you hate that? <laughs> Although, I think most of yours will, and I'll talk to you later about that. In the meanwhile, let me conclude the first part of my show by trying something a little trickier. Let's take, let's take the last number on the board here, 3,969. Would you each enter 3,969 on your calculator? And instead of squaring it this time, I'd like you to take that number and multiply it by any three-digit number that you'd like. But don't tell me what you're multiplying by. Just multiply it by any random three-digit number. So you should have as an answer either a six-digit or possibly a seven-digit number. How many digits do you have, six or seven? Seven. seven. Six. Six. Seven. Six. Seven. 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 Is there any possible way that I could know what six or seven digit numbers they have? Say no. <laughs> Good. Then I shall attempt the impossible, or at least the improbable. What I'd like each of you to do is to call out for me any six of your seven digits, or in your case, five of your six digits, in any order you'd like. One digit at a time, I shall try and determine the digit you've left out. So starting with your seven digit number, call out any six of them. You don't, oh, the original number, I circle it, 3969, times any three digit number of your choice. All right, so you have a seven digit number, call out any six of those seven, uh, please. Zero. Zero five zero four six. Now, now, did you have a seven-digit number originally, or just yeah. six? So I don't heard five numbers. I heard zero five zero four six. Zero. Zero. Yes. Did you leave out the number three? I did. Good. Okay. <laughs> That's one. You've got a six-digit number, is it? Call out five of those six digits loud and clear. One. One. Uh, one. Oh, start. Start from the end. I heard a one, and then. Another one. One. Another one, eight. interesting, an eight. eight. Did you leave out the number eight? Uh, oh, you mean the, the, the number you left out, was it an eight? Yeah. Good, that's what I thought. That, <laughs> that, that, that was a very interesting number, three eights, three ones. Okay, you've got a seven, a seven digit number, is it? Yeah. Okay, call it any six of them in any order. Okay, eight, eight six, six one, one, two, two did you leave out the number five? Yeah. All right, that's three. The odds of me getting all four of these right by pure guessing would be one in 10,000. That's 10 to the fourth power. Okay, any six of yours, really scramble them up this time. Two, five, seven, two, nine, two. Two, five, seven, two, nine, two. This is a tricky one. Do me a favor, if you would, concentrate on the digit you left out. <laughs> 
It doesn't do any good, I know, but it looks dramatic. <laughs> And yet, I seem to be getting a lot of nothing. Did, you didn't leave out a zero, did you? That's why I was getting a lot of nothing. And let's give all four of these people a nice round of applause. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. For my next number, I'd like to present something we mathemagicians refer to as magic squares. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with these, you can kind of think of them as like Sudoku on steroids, and you'll see what I mean by that in just a moment. Now, I've done such an extensive study on magic squares that I'd like to create one for all of you right before your very eyes. But for this, I'll need another assistant, someone here I do not know, and let's see, uh, I don't know you, what's your name? Would you like to come and help me? Why not? <laughs> the cookies are probably more interesting, but join me anyway. What's your name one more time? Pavel. Pavel, let's give Pavel a nice round of applause. Come up here, Pavel. Pavel, if you would stand right there. All right, on that spot. Is that P-A-V-E-L? Yeah, Pavel, let me ask you another question, and if it's too personal, I can change the question. Pavel, are you willing to share with us your birthday, including the year? Mom says yes. <laughs> Pavel, what is your birthday? Seven, a lot of sevens in that day, 7-17-2007, how lucky. All right, so Pavel, if we're gonna, first thing we're going to do is add the numbers in your birthday together. Let's see what we got. 7 plus 17 is 24, plus 20 is 44, plus 7 is 51. So Pavel, your magic number is 51. What I'm going to try and do, Pavel, now is to fill out this box in such a way as to get your magic number appearing here as much as I possibly can. This will take me a couple of seconds, so bear with me here. I think that works. Pavel, would you choose for us any row? Row number two, three, or four, which would you like? Three. Three, all right, class, together. Eight plus 21 is? 29. Plus 16 is? 45. Plus six is? 51. The others were 7, 24, 44, 51, 19, 27, 33, 51, 17, 22, 31, 51. Would you choose a column, Pavel? 1, 2, 3, or 4? 2. 2. All right, class. 17 plus 8 is 25. Plus 21 is 46. Plus 5 is 51. The others were 7, 26, 34, 51, 20, 26, 42, 51, 7, 25, 31, 51. How about that? Thank you. Now, Pavel, I am not through with you. I decided that since this was your magic square, based on your birthday, at no extra charge, I would give you these diagonals as well. Check it out here. 17 plus 21 is 38, plus 6 is 44, plus 7 is 51, 7, 15, 31, 51. But I didn't stop there either. I decided since this was for Pavel, wouldn't it be great if we could get these four in the center to add up as well? Check it out. Out here 8 plus 6 is 14 plus 16 is 30 plus 21 is 51 but did I stop there <laughs> did I stop there no Pavel you may have noticed you may have I put a little extra attention in that corner I did that so I could get these four squares 7 plus 17 is 24 plus 8 is 32 plus 19 is 51 to add up and I figured heck as long as we got that group of four let's have a party we may as well get this group of four 20 27 45 51 8 29, 34, 51, 16, 22, 42, 51, but did I stop there? No, I said Papa wouldn't be happy unless we got this group of four, 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 this group of four. I have to apologize, Pavel. I was not quite able to get this group of four nor that group of four to add up, but I had to do it that way if I was going to get these four in the corners. I knew that would be important to you. 7, 14, 34, 51, but wait, here's the cool part. Pavel, not only do those four numbers in the corners add to 51, if you look at them closely, you'll see we have 7, 17, 2007. I thought you'd like that. So please keep this as a souvenir from me, and let's all give Pavel a nice round of applause. Thank you, Pavel, very much. Hey, speaking of birthdays, by any chance, does anyone here happen to know 
the day of the week that they were actually born on. If you think you know, your actual birthday, raise your hand, starting in the back, sir, what year was it, first of all? 1999. 1999, in what month? April. April what? Ninth. Ninth, was that a Friday? Terrific. Somebody else, uh, how about you, sir, what year? Uh, 94. 94, in what month? January. January what? 18th, was that a Tuesday? Yeah, good. Uh, how, how, how about yours? What year? Uh, it says year. No. Uh, they won't subtract, I know, from... Like, uh, no, 64. 64. In what month? Um, April. April what? 12th. 12th. Was that a Sunday? Terrific. Uh, how about one more? Yes, sir. What year? 97. 97. And what month? August. August what? 18th. 18th. Was that a Monday? Yes, it was. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now, do we have anyone here who uh, does not know their day of week but always wanted to find out? Um, uh, okay, uh, I'll do yours. Now, of course, if you don't know what it is, I could just make up an answer and you'd probably believe me. But luckily, luckily there are apps for everything these days. I'll let one, uh, let one of you help me out here. All you have to do is type in the year and the rest is pretty clear. Um, uh, what year was it, first of all? 1996, so type in the year 1996. Uh, look, at, uh, look at the calendar below, and what month? July. Oh, July, so press the July button. I'm sorry, press the July button. Look at the calendar below, and July what? 29th. 29th, was that a Monday? Yes. yes, I'll tell you what, as long as you have the app with you, let's try something even trickier. The app will go as far back into the past as 1600, and as far into the future as 9,999. Uh, give us a year, any year between 1,600 and 9,999. What year would you like? 8,721. All right, let me think about, let me think about that one here. Okay, and uh, how about a month? Uh, what month would you like? April. Uh, April what? 15th. Will that be a Friday? Yes, and it'll be cloudy, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. In fact, anyone else who wants to find out their day of week, see me after the show. I'll be hanging out at my table over there, and I'll be more than happy to tell you. Uh, yeah, what's that again? So do I do zodiac? Oh, no, no, that you need a different kind of mathematician. Or, or that. Um, now, folks, if I were performing for a different sort of audience, I might follow this up with other feats of magic and mind. But for an audience such as this one, I actually prefer to break the magician's rule and explain to you most of what you've seen me do up here and more. In fact, I'd like to conduct the rest of this program, the next half hour or so, very informally. So feel free at any time to interrupt me with questions, even if it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. It's more interesting that way. In fact, I've got hours and hours of stuff to share with you. So why don't I just start taking your questions now? And uh, who would like the first question? What are you interested in? Yes, sir. Why, why, I, why I fell in love with both the magic and the math? You know, that's a good question. I, I think as a kid, I just really enjoyed numbers and patterns for as long as I can remember. I mean, if there's anything that's innate, I, the skill here is not innate, but sort of a, 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 a general interest, passion for numbers and patterns, I think I've had for as long as I can remember, probably for as long as my mother can remember. Um, as for the magic, I think as a kid, I just loved showing off, you know. I outgrew that, of course, but, uh, <laughs> but as a kid, I just, uh, I was just a real ham, and I would do anything to get attention, and I, and I liked magic like many kids did, but like, unlike most kids, I didn't outgrow it, you know. I kept doing it, and I would do it. I did shows in, um, for, for uh, birthday parties, kids' parties, not with the math, just, you know, the rabbit out of the hat, falling on my tush, making the kids laugh. And uh, I was the great Benjamini, <laughs> performing throughout the east side of Cleveland, Ohio. And, um, and then as I started doing shows for older audiences, my, uh, my father said, well, hey, why don't you throw some of that number stuff into your act? I think that's 
even more impressive. So I tried it, and to my surprise, it got the best reaction. So I said, hmm, if people like that, imagine if I practiced it more, or did bigger problems, did them faster, and then that got all kinds of attention, and that's where, why I'm here today. So I'm, I've, I started it, though, when I was about your age, when I, when I was in college, was when I started putting together this math show, and I've just been having fun with it ever since. Thanks for asking. I don't get that question too often. Yes, please. What's your favorite math factor phenomenon that's interesting to like most people? Okay, what's my, some of my favorite math facts that would surprise most people? Okay, let's see. My favorite numbers, my favorite numbers out there, and everybody has a favorite number, right? You have a favorite color, favorite animal. Um, my, 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 my single favorite number might be pi, right, or, or the golden ratio or something. My favorite group of numbers are called the Fibonacci numbers. Ah, we've got other Fibonacci fans here. The Fibonacci numbers are as easy to understand as 1 plus 1, which is 2. Then 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 3 is 5. 3 plus 5 is 8 and so on. Here, we got two boards. I'll, I'll keep on going. Uh, 13, 21. What will be the next Fibonacci number? 34. The next one? 55 and so on. They go on forever. Um, and you could spend your life discovering beautiful facts about these numbers. A lot of the research that I do as a mathematician is studying these numbers and numbers like them. Uh, so for example, uh, suppose you like to square numbers, right? And we all like to square numbers, right? Who doesn't? Um, if I square the Fibonacci numbers, all right, we get uh, 1 squared is 1, 1, 4, 9, 25, 64, and so on. Here, I'll just show off 169, 441, 11. I don't really need those, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Now, you know that when you add Fibonacci numbers together, you get the next Fibonacci number. That's how they're born. But you wouldn't expect something nice to happen when you add the squares together. But check this out. If I add 1 plus 1, I get 2, which is not on this list, but it's on this list. It's a Fibonacci number. 1 plus 4 is 5. 4 plus 9 is 13. 9 plus 25 is 34, and so on. Um, here's another one. If you, um, if you square these Fibonacci numbers and you look at like 2 squared is 4 and its neighbors multiply to 3. 1 times 3 is 3, which is 1 away. Uh, 3 squared is 9 and its neighbors, 2 and 5, multiply to 10, which is just 1 away. 5 squared is 25. Its neighbors multiply to 24. And that always happens. That goes on forever. If you add the squares together, let's say you don't just add two of them, but you add like all of them in a group, like 1 plus 1 plus 4 is 6. OK, you can get me that far. 1 plus 1 plus 4 plus 9 would be 15. Add 25 to that, we get 40. I'll just do one more. Add 64, we get 104. Now, those aren't Fibonacci numbers, but if you look at them closely, you might see the Fibonacci numbers buried inside. Does anybody see them? And what do you see? What do you see? One of our math circle kids. What do you see? What is special about 6? OK, so 6 is 2 times 3. 15 is 3 times 5. 40 is 5 times 8. 2, 3, 5, 8. Who do we appreciate? <laughs> Fibonacci. No one, I tried that cheer in high school. It never caught on, but anyway. Um, so yeah, so, do, uh, anyway, so 104, that's uh, 8 times 13, right? That's pretty cool. Um, now, as, as fun as it is to explore these patterns, and I've got one more. I mean, when you ask what was the most mind-blowing of the patterns, I've still got one more up my sleeve. Um, let me tell you what it is. I'll tell you what. But I want to explain why this one is true. But let me show you one other, because if I don't say it now, I'll probably forget it. Um, my favorite Fibonacci fact is, um, involves, the, involves greatest common divisors. Now, what's that? If I asked you for the greatest common divisor of 20 and 90, what's the biggest number that goes into 20 and goes into 90? It would be 
10, that's right, 10 is the greatest common divisor of 20 and 90. Get this, suppose I ask for the greatest common divisor of the 20th Fibonacci number and the 90th Fibonacci number, guess what that is? More poetic than 10, F10, the 10th Fibonacci number. Whoa. The GCD of the Fs is the F of the GCD. Now that to me is utterly mind blowing, right? I mean, why that should be. Um, but of course, as fun as it is to discover these patterns and being shown these patterns, it's also really, it's really very satisfying to understand why these patterns are out there. Let me just try and explain this one here where we saw that, um, we saw that one squared, Yes, sir. Who figured that out? That was figured out by one of my favorite mathematicians uh, of the 19th century. His name was Edouard Luca. And uh, uh, sometimes people mispronounce it Lucas, but it's Luca. And um, he 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 did he studied math purely for the fun of it. Um, in fact, he was the one that gave name to the Fibonacci numbers. I mean, they, they, one of their first appearances in history was in this book uh, on arithmetic. The first book on arithmetic for the Western world was written by Leonardo of Pisa, nicknamed Fibonacci, and, um, and who, who took the, you know, transformed, um, Western, uh, tr transformed Europe from using the Roman numeral system to the more efficient Hindu Arabic numeral system. That's, that's how that was, uh, and, and he wrote the book that taught the systems. And one of his exercises had to do with rabbit populations and the Fibonacci numbers showed up in there. So, but he didn't, he didn't play with the numbers like, like I was showing you here. But this guy, Luca, he loved playing with things. Have you ever seen the, the puzzle, the Tower of Hanoi, where you have to transfer these disks from one peg to another, always keeping things? That was his, uh, his invention. He wrote the first book on recreational mathematics. He came up with rules for figuring out the days of the week of dates in history. I mean, a really, really clever guy. Um, but so anyway, and he was the one who um, first discovered this formula about the greatest common divisors of the Fs. And he's got great theorems about Pascal's triangle and talk to me about those later. But, 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 look, but let's look at this pattern here. The one that said, if I add the squares of Fibonacci number, one squared plus one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus five squared plus eight squared, we got 104, which is eight times 13. And let me try to prove to you why that works. And then you'll have a sense as to why it will always work without any words. Well, not too many words. I can't help myself. But with very few words, really just by drawing a picture. So here we go. One squared, let me draw one square. Okay, a square that has area one. And next to it, I'll put another one square. Together, they form a rectangle of, of height one and length two. So since it's two, since one plus one is two, I'm going to put underneath it another square whose area is two squared. Okay? And now this has a width of two and a height of one plus two is three. So next to that, I'll put a square, uh, a three by three square. All right, and underneath that, I'll put a square of what length? All right, two plus three is five. And next to that, I'll put a square that has length, height, what? Eight. Eight. Okay, so now I ask you the question, what is, now that I've drawn this picture, I kind of tilted a little bit, but, but imagine this is a rectangle. Um, I ask you, what is the area of this rectangle? Well, there are two good answers to it, right? On the one hand, you could say, oh, it's the sum of the areas of the squares that compose it. It's 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 5 squared plus 8 squared, right? That's the area. On the other hand, what else is the area? It's a rectangle. We know the area of a rectangle is its base times the height. What's the height here? 8. What's the base? 
5 plus 8, which is the next Fibonacci number, 13. Right? So the area is 8 times 13. Now, which answer was right, the first one or the second one? They were both right, and therefore they are equal to each other. And that's why the sums of the squares of 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and 8 will give you 8 times 13. Let's hear it for Fibonacci. <laughs> Thank you for asking that. I don't often get to answer that, uh, talk about that. Other questions? Yes, sir. How many perfect numbers are there in what's the largest? Oh, <laughs> well, we keep finding more of them. A perfect number is a number where when you add all of the proper divisors, you get itself. So the first perfect number is 6. Because the proper, what, what are the numbers that divide into 6? 1, 2, and 3. And sure enough, 6 equals 1 plus 2 plus 3. The next perfect number, anybody know it? Is 28. What are its divisors? Well, 1 goes into it. What's the, what, does 2 go into it? Yes. Yeah. Does 3 go into it? No. How about 4? Yeah, four it's 4 times 7. And in fact, 7 is the next divisor, followed by 14, followed by 28. But that wouldn't be a proper divisor. So when I add those numbers, I, I do get 28. The next one turns out to be 496. The next one turns out to be 8,128. And you might say, gosh, is there any pattern to this? Is it just kind of random? Truth is, there is a neat pattern to this. And, and, let, let, let's, let, let, and again, it's kind of like the, the, the pattern we just saw there. Let's look at factoring these numbers. Okay, So 6, just like with Fibonacci, is 2 times 3. 28 is 4 times 7. 496 is 16 times 31. Now, are we seeing any pattern here? We have 2 times 3, 4 times 7, 16 times 31. I'll tell you, this, nu this number is 64 times what? If it follows the pattern, it would be 64 times what? Well, we're, how, notice that 7 is, tw is double 4 minus 1. 31 is double 16 minus 1. So 64 times, we hope, 127. Double this number minus 1, and we get 8,128. Now, now, you'd say, well, why don't we have a number like 8 times, what would it be? 8 times 15, right? If I double, 8 times 15 is 120, but that's not perfect. If, I add, if we add up its divisors, we get something bigger than 120. Um, but, what, but why do you think that is? That 8 times 15 is not perfect, but, when I, but the one with 3, 7, 31, and 127, those are perfect. What do you think? Exactly. That second number has to be prime. Now, what's interesting is if we look at last year, last year, and this is, last year was 2016. 2016 happens to be 32 times 63. It follows that pattern, 63. It's a power of 2, right? 32 is power of 2. 2, 4, 16, 64, you know, 32. That was the missing, missing there, right? 30 times 60 is 2016. But is it perfect? No, because 63 is not prime. But if it were, then last year would have been perfect. <laughs> Too bad for us. It wasn't. Uh, OK. Um, Gosh, so maybe there is something to numerology after all. But, um, so let's see. Uh, so, so the question is, are there infinitely many perfect numbers? The great mathematician Euler proved that, if a, if a, that 
First of all, we can prove, it's relatively easy to prove, that if you have a number that's of the form 2 to the n times 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1, right? A power of 2 times the next power of 2 minus 1. If this number is prime, then Euler showed the easy direction was that such numbers will always be perfect if this number is prime. Um, and the harder direction was to show that every even perfect number will be of this form. Now it's cool that you asked this question because I can mention to you now two problems that are still unsolved in mathematics. One of which is, um, are there any odd perfect numbers? And the answer is, we don't know. We absolutely, we've, never, we've not been able to find one and it's been investigated into the zillions, maybe even to the gazillions, I don't know. Large number has been checked out. We haven't been able to find one, but we can't prove that they don't exist. We can prove that there aren't any even prime numbers after two. That's easy to prove. But we can't prove that there aren't any odd perfect numbers. And um, we also can't prove if there are infinitely many perfect numbers. We know there are infinitely many primes. Again, we have proofs. The great Greek mathematician Euclid showed, proved, that there were infinitely many primes. Are there infinitely many perfect numbers? We don't know. We've only been able to find about a dozen or two of them. And, it, uh, and I think all of them, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll stop right there. But that's a uh, uh, so, so there's some easy unsolved problems in mathematics that are fun to ponder. Thank you for, for asking. I'm getting the most original questions at this show. I, I love this. Yes, please. Did you ever draw any inspiration or learn any tricks from the Gilbert family? Like Frank Gilbert and his wife and their kids, was better known as Cheaper by the Dozen. Oh yeah, yeah. There, there is a there's a pl there's a play and a, a, a book called Cheaper by the Dozen, and in, in that Cheaper by the Dozen uh, show, I, I there uh, the 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 head of the household, this family of you know twelve kids or so, and this uh, uh, this this guy, the head of the household, believes in doing everything very efficiently, and he comes up with a a way of his own for like squaring numbers that are near fifty. Um, it's different than my method, but it's cool that it actually arrived on Broadway. <laughs> you know, squaring numbers made it to Broadway. Let me show you the method that I use for squaring numbers. I'll, I'll start with two-digit numbers, and if you're interested, we could push it higher to uh, three-digit numbers or higher. Um, so somebody give me a small two-digit number as our first example. Uh, 75. 75. All right, not the smallest of two-digit numbers. <laughs> Let me save that as my second example. Uh, how about a how about a 29? All right, we'll do that one first. All right. Although actually, once you learn my method, that one's going to be easier than this one. But I want to start off small. So um, so now number 29 is not a bad number to multiply. But what number close to 29 is much easier? 30. So I'm going to go up one to 30. And whatever comes up must come down. If I go up one to 30, I have to balance it by going down one. To 28. So I start by doing 30 times 28. Now don't panic, that's 3 times 28 with a friendly zero attached. I like zeros. Let's do 3 times 28 and let's do it from left to right. If there's only one thing you remember today, it's that I do all of my calculations from left to right. That's the way we read numbers. That's the way we pronounce numbers. With practice, it's the way you should calculate numbers, especially if you're doing it in your head. So left to right, I do 3 times 28. 3 times 20 is 60. 3 times 8 is 24. 60 plus 24 from left to right is 84. So that's really 840 with my friendly zero. And almost done. All we have to add to this is the square of the number we went up and down. We went up and down 1. 1 squared is 1. And there's your answer, 841. 
Let's do another example. All right, we got one right here ready for us. 75. When they end in 5, it's especially easy. This time, let's go down 5 to 70. To balance it, we go up to 80. 70 times 80 is... 5,600, 5,600, and we, all we add to that is, and we always add, always add, the square of 5, which is 25, and there's your answer, 5,625. Cool, right? Now, of course, we not only want to learn how to calculate this, but this being a mathematical audience, it's important to see why it's true. And luckily, in the algebra is very nice and easy. And for those of you taking algebra or who have taken algebra and wondered, what is this good for? It's good for plenty. But here's, here, here is one cool application. So if I want to square a number, let's say I want to calculate a squared. Then here's what I'm telling you to like. Think of a being like 75 squared. Then I'm telling you to take a and go up some distance d, like d is 5. Take a, go down the same distance d, multiply those numbers together, and then add what? d squared. D squared. And will that work? Well, let's do our algebra. a plus d times a minus d is a squared, a squared minus d squared. When you add the d squared, the d's disappear and you're left with a squared. Let's hear it for algebra, isn't that right? <laughs> so, and this still gives you the confidence that this is going to work not just for two-digit numbers, but a and d, they could have been any numbers. They could have been three-digit numbers, four-digit numbers. They could have been negative numbers. They could have been rational, irrational numbers. It's still going to work. Um, here, I'll show you just quickly. Let's take this a step further because I have to confess, I've been squaring two-digit numbers for such a large fraction of my life that they've un unintentionally become memorized, the two-digit ones have. But the three-digit ones, I still have to calculate. I'd say 95% of them, I still have to calculate. Give me a three-digit number. 473. Now, be, which, by the way, is 223,729, just to get that out of the way. Um, but before we do 473, when I square a two-digit number, I always round to the nearest um, round two-digit number. Like for 75, I rounded it to 70. For 29, I rounded it to 30. But when I square a three-digit number, I round it to the nearest hundred, the mul nearest multiple of a hundred. So I'm going to have to go up to 500. How far up? 27. Now, just as a side calculation, let's do 27 squared. We go up 3 to 30, down 3 to 24. 3 times 24 is 72, so that's 720, plus the square of 3 is 9, is 729. Why did I do that? Because when I square 473, I go up 27 to 500, down 27 to 446, multiply 500 times 446. Now let me pause for a moment. We could do that by doing 5 times each of these numbers. Or what's nice about multiplying by 500? What's special about 500 that makes it easy? It's half of 1,000. So if I take half of 446, and multiply that by 1,000, that's much easier. What's half of 446? 223. Two, two, so this is going to be 223,000. What do we add to that? The square of 27, which is happily staring us in the face. 27 squared is 729. And there's your answer, as promised, 223,729. Thank you very much. Other questions? What else would you like to know? Yes, sir, in the back. How many hours a day do you practice math? I love that question. How many hours a day do I practice math? And in particular, how much do I practice this stuff? I'd say on average about zero. Um, here's the, I, I, I mean, how many hours a day do I practice riding a bicycle? You know, I, I do bike to work, but I think even if I took a, 
you know, when I took my last sabbatical in, in England where I didn't want to be biking on the wrong side of the road, I, I didn't ride a bike there. And yet I came back home after my sabbatical and I got back on the bike. So I think once you reach a certain skill level in doing this, it stays with you. Now, maybe I'm not at peak performance if I, if I go a year without practicing this, just like if I go a year off my bicycle, you know, I may not be quite where I was when I left off, but um, the good news is with just a very little bit of practice, once you've mastered that skill, um, it's just a matter of developing the right habits, like typing, uh, playing an instrument. I mean, if you stop playing an instrument after a few years, it's going to go away, but a lot of your muscle memory stays. Um, if this is maybe as good a time as any to do my quick commercial, if you are interested in learning more about this stuff, I brought with me, as Professor Wiggins mentioned in the introduction, I brought with me some of my DVD courses. Um, they're produced by a company called The Great Courses. Anybody have the great, the great Courses? A wonderful place. They've got courses on all subjects from mathematics, science, philosophy, history, religion, ph gardening, photography, I mean everything. And um, they're uh, for, oh, hundreds of courses and I've had the pleasure of creating four different courses for them. They're all DVD, video courses. Um, the first one uh, is the, maybe the most popular one is the secrets of mental math. It's everything I know about doing math in your head, mental addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, estimation, squaring, cubing, figuring out birth dates, uh, everything I know in 12 lectures on two DVDs, 30 minutes each. They sell this online for about $200. I sell it for $40. So if you're interested, see me after the show. Um, also, I have um, a course, this is math in your head. I've got a course that's math in your school. It's middle school, high school, early college level mathematics, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, calculus, as well as fun topics like uh, the mathematics of pi and e and infinity, Fibonacci numbers, mathematical games, mathematical magic. I want you not just to learn the math, I want you to really like the math. This has four DVDs. Oh, and they all come with workbooks with problems and exercises and everything like that. But this has four DVDs and, oh, and this is twice as, twice as much as the other course, but it doesn't sell for twice as much. It's only $60. I have a course on the mathematics of games, gambling, and puzzles. So if you ever wanted to take me to Vegas, this is how to do it. It's got uh, games of chance, uh, casino games, poker, blackjack, backgammon, chess, uh, how to solve Sudoku, and how to solve the Rubik's Cube. Um, that's got three DVDs and sells for $50. Finally, I, my most advanced course is on the mathematics that underlies computer science. That's discrete mathematics. It's combinatorics. It's number theory. It's graph theory. It's my favorite part of mathematics. I've been teaching it at Harvey Mudd College for the last 28 years. Uh, it also has four DVDs and that sells for $60. So if you're interested, see me after the show. I take cash, check, or credit card. You can get, get a discount if you get any three of them. Get all four of them for $190. That's less than it would cost to get any one of them online. So if you're interested, see me afterwards. That's the end of my uh, commercial. Uh, how about one more question, and then I'll launch into my grand finale. What else would you like to know? Yes, sir. Yes. Does it make sense for them to learn more mathematics? So if you are never going to need calculus, I, know, I I'm, I'm personally feel that the educational system that we have right now spends too much time trying to prepare people for calculus, which if, yes, if you go on in science or engineering or economics, you're going to need calculus. But on a day-to-day -day life sort of way, you're not going to use calculus despite what your math teacher may tell you, right? <laughs> I've never, I, I use calculus in my research, but I have not used it. I've never been a situation at home where I say, ooh, I'm glad I know calculus because now I know how to explain what's going on. I mean, calculus is the language of science and nature. Laws of nature are written in calculus, but on a, in a sort of a day-to-day -day practical way, I don't use it. But if I could rewrite the rules, I would have us I'd, first of all, I'd give people more choice. You know, not just, you know, not everybody wants to, is meant 
is going to benefit from doing calculus. The course that I would recommend everybody take at some point in their lives would be statistics, probability and statistics. That's the course, and by the way, now more than ever, we're in the, we're, we're, we're in the age of data and information, big data, data science, uh, you know, and, 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 and that's something that is very practical. It's, it's, it's the laws of chance. It's, it's looking at numbers and figuring out information, being able to separate the signal from the noise. That's useful. You make calculated risks every day of your life, and to some degree, the better you understand probability and expected value and standard deviations, the better you can make those choices. So I'm a big, big believer in probability and statistics. Um, so I've got a three-minute TED talk that pretty much says just what you just heard. Um, Let's see, so, but, but I also think there's some beautiful sides to mathematics that, that you never see in the curriculum. You know, things about the Fibonacci numbers and pi and infinity and, and what makes mathematics a, a creative subject, not just a formulaic subject. Ever too many people think of math as formulas, but in fact, it's ideas. It's the poetry of ideas. Anyway, so, um, Thank you for asking that. Let me, let me end because I know we're at four, but I will hang out for, for a good long time afterwards. If you have any other questions, I'll be at my table or outside. But let me end things with something I mentioned at the beginning of the program. I'm going to try to square a five-digit number. But to make my job more interesting for you as well as for me, I'm going to do this last problem thinking out loud so you can actually honestly hear what's going on in my mind while I do a calculation of this size. Now let's create a five digit number. How about, uh, how about we take five people over in this section. If I can get five of you to each call out a single digit between zero and nine, that will be the five digit number that I'll use. Seven. Seven. Eight. Three. Six. And somebody give me one more digit. Five. Five. Okay. 78,365 squared. Let me explain to you how I'm going to attempt this problem. I'm going to break the problem down into three parts. I'll do 78,000 squared plus 365 squared plus 78,000 times 365 times 2. Add all those numbers together and with any luck, arrive at the answer. Now let me recap, thank you, <laughs> while I explain something else. As I do this last calculation, you will hear certain words, not just numbers, but actual words enter the calculation. Let me explain what that is. This is a phonetic code, a mnemonic device that I use that allows me to convert numbers into words. I store them as words and later on retrieve them as numbers. I know it sounds complicated. It's not. I just don't want you to think you're seeing something crazy happening up here. There's definitely a method to my madness. One last instruction for my judges with calculators. Now, who's got an answer? Raise your hand. A few of you have checked me out. Good. You should have a 10-digit number beginning with 6, ending with 5, in between. I don't know yet. There's a 50% chance that I'll make a mistake somewhere in between. If I do, don't tell me what the mistake is. Just say you're close or something, and I'll try and figure it out, which can be pretty entertaining in itself. If, however, I am right, whatever you do, don't keep it to yourselves. Make sure everybody knows that I got the answer right, because this is my big finish, OK? So without any more stalling, and I have been a little, here we Go. I'll start the problem in the middle with 78 times 365 times 2. Now, 365 times 2 is 730, which ends in 0. I'll take advantage of that. Now, 78 times 73 is 70 times 81 plus 8 times 3 is 5670 plus 24 is 5694. Times 10 is 56,940. 56,940 becomes leash bears. Leash bears is 56,940. That seems right. I'll go on. Leash bears. Okay. Next, I do 78 squared, which is 6084, right? 80 times 76 plus 2 squared. 6084. So I can say 6 
billion. Take the 84,000, add that to leash. 84, but I, 84 plus 56 is 140, but I see a carry coming, so I'll say 141 million. Bears, bears. Okay, finally we do 365 squared. That's 400 times 330 plus 35 squared. It's 132,000 plus 1,225. It's 133,225. No nail if I need it. No nail. Take the 133, add that to bears to get. <laughs> 73,225. Yes, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed Math of Magics. I'm Arthur Benjamin. Thank you.